Nation. Today we're going to teach you how to invest like a millionaire because what better way to get rich than to just copycat the rich dudes. That's what I've been doing this whole time. Eventually it worked out for me. So I'm going to teach you a couple tips and tricks from some of my wealthiest clients. We get a lot of investor client applications. We feel probably about 25 to 30 a day. And I'd say about one person a day has 500,000 or more to spend at the very minimum. And I'd say it's probably more common that you see like three, four people a week that have a million dollars in cash to invest. And these people behave distinctly differently than the clients that have 100 or 150,000. I'd say the normal, relatively deep pocketed investor, intro real estate investor is really what I call that, right? So these clients, they've got some different behaviors. They've got some different financial behaviors. They've got some different investment strategies, and they've got some different general business philosophies. I'm going to share those with you guys today. It's one of my favorite things to take on from these folks. Actually, these clients have helped me really build my business because I've learned a lot from them over the course of the three, four, five years I've been interacting with them. And usually what I've done with the info I've gained from them is I've used them, used them to make adjustments to the investment firm. So I go back to Ace and I say, what do these clients want? What kind of services do they value? What kind of product do they prefer? How do they want our process to look? And I've gone back and I've made kind of those tweaks, those iterations to our business model so that we could better serve these clients and then also offer a product and service that the more successful, the wealthier investors want to our whole client base. It's been tremendously valuable to us and to them. And today, I'm going to share a lot of these lessons with you. You didn't miss the coupon code yet, though. I'm going to give it to you in a second. I'm going to share a lot of these lessons that these clients have taught me with you. So hopefully you can implement them and invest like a millionaire, right? Which will hopefully get you there. <laughs> Fake it till you make it, right? And that's kind of the coupon code today. So we're not faking it. You're just going to kind of copy their ideas till you make it. The coupon code is all lowercase one word till you make it. T-I-L-Y-O-U. M-A-K-E-I-T. One word, I'm never going to say it again. Do not post it in the comments in this chain. I'll turn off comments if I see people starting to post them. I saw people posting it a bunch of times last week and I was thinking about turning off the comments to start the live session uh, this week just so you guys don't make it hard for everyone else to get the freebie. Let the people who showed up to the early portion of the live and watched it all the way through be the ones that get the free stuff. There's only 40 freebies going out. This is how it's gonna work. 40 freebies from the Ace Toolkit store. Any of those spreadsheets, the legendary deal calculator that I'll be known for, it'll be printed on my grave when I die, that freaking deal calculator. Here lies Big Daddy Ace, known for selling 20,000 spreadsheets at 40 bucks a pop in the first year. Uh, <laughs> that plus everything else that comes with it, the financing starter kit, the property management interview guide, I think there's a contract pack and there's like a deal analysis cheat sheet too. It's all pretty awesome stuff. It's all 40 bucks a pop, but you can get it for free today. As long as you guys don't keep sharing the coupon code in the damn comments, you might have a chance because they go fast. Now here's the tip for you. These sheets are not going to be available for free until after this live is over. Once the live is over, I'm going to go ahead and post the live on my page, then repost it in a story. And then following that story, there'll be another Instagram story announcing that the code is active. Now's your chance to jump into the store, put that code in that slot, check out and get it. Now, if you don't see a coupon code slot at the checkout before you click that pay now box, that means you're either too soon. You went there before the story was announced, which a lot of people do, or you're too late. And if you got there a minute too late, you're too late. Trust me, Ace Nation moves fast. You guys are a bunch of hungry freaking wolves, piranhas, whatever hungry animal um, you, want, you want to call yourself. You guys are just gobbling up these freebies every single week. I can't figure out for the life of me why some of you guys don't just pay me 40 bucks, to be quite honest with you, because it's just 40 bucks, right? It's not like a, a $500 program that I'm giving away for free, which in fact is not included in the giveaway. The virtual investor's guide is always going to be 495. I had someone complain to me this week that he wanted a discount. I'm like, I can't give it to you, man. I give you all these free live sessions. And I promise you, if you could afford to buy, he said he was living off ramen and his money was really tight right now, but he really wanted to learn. I said, Hey man, if you can afford the rental property, you could certainly afford the course. That's the way I designed it. If you can't afford the rental property, you're better off watching all the free live sessions. I give you every week. Anyways, I don't hold back. So the course is not going to be included. Um, in this giveaway. And of course, guys, I'm giving you all this free game. So I get to plug the course just one or two little times in this live session, don't I? So my course story for the week, I call it a little bit of everything. I had a client come to me, him and his wife, 
both big fans. I got in this investor call this week. Both software engineers, both combined, they said they were saving like 120 grand a year between the two of them, which is pretty fucking awesome. That's enough money to really get to investing in real estate and getting that snowball rolling. But they wanted to do it in a variety of ways. So they said they picked up the course, they took it, they absolutely loved it, and they're applying it in two different ways. They're gonna be buying rental properties. Let me have a sip of my coffee. The investor guide does not include the spreadsheets. I wanted to keep them all separate for you guys so there's not weird bundles and stuff. But they took the course, they said they loved it, they said they're applying it in two fashions. Number one is buying rentals from us with the income that they don't use for any business endeavors, right? So they wanna passively just store the income in properties that someone else does all the work to find and get, which is us, right? We do all that work. And then their other business, they're using the course fundamentals to, to, to be able to get rolling is they're starting to wholesale in Utah, now they don't live in Utah, they live in Southern California. So they're starting a wholesaling business in Utah to generate some additional income and learn how acquisitions in real estate works. And the beautiful thing about that program is it, it's foundational enough so that you can take this business process that we use here that I've packaged into this consumer friendly product and be able to apply it to not only passive investing and passive income, but also in building a business that generates revenue to further feed that passive income. That's the beautiful thing. I love to hear you guys Take that program and use it as intended to create a business model because it is essentially that it's a business model. It's not a, let me teach you how things work. Let me basically teach you a class on real estate investing. It's not at all that. So that's my story for the week, except for the fact that someone posted this morning that she's got 42 doors and her mama loves me and her husband loves me and her whole team. And by the way, she took the course recently and she's learned new things too, right? Even at 42 doors, she's been doing this for a while. She still picked up some stuff. I'm just happy to hear someone's mama loves me. Moms have always kind of loved me, so I guess that's not too new to me. But to hear someone's real estate investor mom love me on Instagram and love my Instagram page, it just makes me very satisfied that I could reach a maybe a 60 year old or something like that with this page. Anyways, enough plugging. Look, I'm going to talk to you guys about millionaires. I'm going to talk to you guys about millionaires and what they do. These are clients that come to me with all these people at very minimum have a million dollar net worth excluding their primary residence. Right now, most of these folks actually have a million dollars in liquidity and I'm talking about stocks plus cash. A good amount of them have a million dollars in cash and a handful of my clients make a million dollars a year or more. They make seven figures a year. And these are the financial behaviors, the investment strategies, and the general business philosophies that they use. You should probably steal these ideas. There's just five of them. I'm gonna explain them to you. I'm gonna rattle them off pretty quickly. It's gonna be a dense but value-packed live session so we could actually do some Q&A afterwards. I want you to write these down somewhere where you're gonna see them repeatedly because these are highly transferable, useful, practical, kind of even like you know transcendent strategies, mindset pieces, I guess, investment behaviors that you need to get to the top of the mountain. I promise you, if you don't do all five of these, you're never gonna to get to that top, top, top position. These are universal behaviors across my wealthiest and most successful clients, and they got there for a reason. I belong to this group. I believe in all these things. I'm a big subscriber. Listen to them. Number one, they keep cash. They're not afraid of their cash not generating its maximum return because of inflation or whatever other reason. These folks have a system to be able to identify good opportunities or a plan to identify good opportunities. They know what their criteria is for a good opportunity and they keep funds available for when those opportunities arise and they keep reserves so they have flexibility under tough times. These folks are always poised and they're unaffected by market changes and when good deals come across their desks, they're always ready to strike. They keep cash. I have a buddy that I'm hanging out with actually yesterday. I was having a little beer night with the guys and uh, one of my friends said, hey, dude, uh, I'm sitting on a lot of cash right now. What should I do? I'm like, well, what are you talking about? How much cash? He said, well, about 300,000 cash and then 200K in a HELOC. And I just feel like it's just sitting. And I told him, no, it's not. That is not too much cash. If you don't know exactly what it is you want to invest in with that cash, don't force it in there. Call that your reserve and then find a way to like identify opportunities. Start thinking about what it is that's worth you placing that cash in. Because you haven't found it yet. Obviously, you're holding on to it because you don't think something out there is good enough. You're not fully prepared to invest it. But your 300K in this time, he's in the mortgage business. He made 
great money previous years. He's making presumably less these years, still probably making pretty good money, but he needs a buffer. He needs some flexibility and he needs to feel good about his opportunities and his opportunity fund. And having cash in your account is a great way to do it. A lot of my wealthy investor clients have seven figures sitting. A lot of them have seven figures sitting. And they're not like worth $100 million. These guys have a lot of funds ready. They're not emergency funds. They're opportunity funds. And that's why I like to have two as an opportunity fund. Rich investors keep cash. Number two, you're going to like this one. This is one that you haven't heard me say too often. They make quick decisions and they invest in this skill set in the ability to make quick decisions. Why? Because their time is extremely valuable. I mean, anyone who's making seven figs a year or has seven figs cash sitting around, they got there because they're worth something on an hourly, per minute, per hour, per day, per week, per month basis, right? They value that time and they're willing to trade money for time. They're not willing to trade time for money, right? That's the evolution. They transition from being willing to trade time for money to being willing to trade money for time. So they invest money in learning skills. They invest time also in learning skills to make themselves more efficient. And one of the, th the skills that they value at a high clip is being able to make snap decisions and good judgments quickly so that they don't spend a lot of time thinking about what to do. They spend more time doing. Now, when it comes to your investment decisions, you have to learn how to make quick decisions. You have to have a good process. You have to have a well-defined criteria. And you have to know what you're willing to spend on something so that when you see it come around, our most successful clients, the, one that get, the ones that get the best deals and constantly get fed and buy the most per year, by the way, they know exactly what they want. When we send that property out, they sign up on that list the, the night of, right? So we send these properties out to our clients in the afternoon usually. They see it the night of, they sign up, we send them a short list email the next morning, they're asking for a contract, they're not asking follow-up questions, they know exactly what they want, they make that decision very quickly so that they can move on to the next thing that makes them money, right? They're always thinking multiple paydays ahead. So they have to make decisions quickly. Number three, they don't try to eke out slightly higher returns. This is an efficiency thing too. These clients of mine, they're not trying to strain to figure out how to turn a nine cap into a nine and a half cap. That's not their plan. Their goal is to allocate and go back to what it was that got them that money to allocate in the first place. They're not over here cherry picking stocks. This was my mistake up till now. I was over here looking at all these different stocks and I was beating the market, by the way. Over the last three years, I've over doubled the S&P's average returns. And I was proud of it until I realized that I only invest several thousand dollars a month in the stock market, seven, eight thousand dollars, right? So it's not worth my time to get a 20% return over a 10, if I'm gonna spend a couple hours a day reading stock articles and pick it, just grab some fucking funds and keep moving. And that's what these clients have taught me. They look at my properties, they go, quality property meets my fundamental criteria, return meets my minimum criteria, price point works, I'm ready to buy. They're not thinking about, well, maybe I'll wait for the one that's a slightly better deal. They don't think like that. They're just thinking about the next deal, the volume of deals, allocation. Right? So they're not trying to eke out higher returns. The fourth one, this is another one you've never heard me say. Maybe. You've heard me say it like variations of this, but you haven't heard me say this specifically. They keep their business and their investments separate. What do I mean by that? They're not over here making money in one business and one day job and then running on over to real estate and going, yeah, you know what, I wanna buy some rentals. And then I also wanna find some off-market deals at a discount for market value. And then I also wanna like find deals from you, Elliot, with like equity and then like value add so I can like manage the project. No, they keep their business and their investments separate. They draw lines between the two and they go, this is an investment. This is not where I put my effort, this is where I put my money. And that's a, that's a distinction you keep hearing me kind of allude to over the course of this live. Rich people tend to disambiguate. They have a clear separation between time and money, a crystal clear distinction between time and money. They do not bleed them together. They're two completely different resources with, with their own kind of value restrictions and sets of guidelines that they follow when they're allocating time and money, right? So the rich folks, 
Don't start going, hey, I got to put my money in this thing, which means I got to put my time in this thing. No, they have a place where they plan to put their time and a place where they plan to put their money. And they don't let the two get confused or confounded together. So they're over here hustling in their business that got them rich in the first place. And they're just taking the funds from that and they're pouring it into their investments if the business does not require those funds. That's it. And they're done with it. They get back to the thing that got them rich in the first place. My money is not made on my rentals. My rentals store my wealth. My money's made flipping properties primarily. And then secondarily, this business, this education business is starting to grow as well. That's where I put my energy. My rentals, dude, shit goes wrong. Uh, let's see, a vacancy, a rehab costs $1,000 more than I planned. Uh, a property has a furnace go out. I don't ask for a second or third quote. As long as it's within some sort of reason, I'm like, cool, send the money. Send the wire. I hardly review the statements, guys. I probably should a little bit better, uh, but <laughs> I hardly review the statements. Why? Because those couple bucks I'm gonna save there, mm -mm, the money's being stored as intended. I've got a business to run. You guys have something to do to focus on income or to improve your income. Don't pour that effort into your investments. Just pour your money into your investments and figure out how to make more in the first place. Number five, you heard me say this yesterday. They don't wanna retire. I mean, they want to retire someday, right? Like when they're about to die or something, but they don't want to retire now. They definitely don't want to buy real estate so they can retire early, quit working, have freedom, right? What they realize is these people have gotten rich. Most of them self-made, by the way. I have not encountered too many trust fund babies um, in this business. I've encountered people that have had like guidance from, you know, family businesses, but not too many of them got money. And I've encountered a lot of people that got no money from nobody and built something respectable, right? I mean, you know, like, like legacy-ish, right? Something you could pass on to your kids or that will create generational wealth. They did it by themselves and they understand that there's no such thing as getting rich quick. The people who got rich don't think it's just this magical, easy process where you just do something and then boom, it works. You pour a, cu pour a couple bucks into a couple rental properties, half a million dollars goes into rentals and before you know it, oh, you're just chilling on a beach drinking pina coladas. No, they don't expect that at all. That's one reason they don't expect to retire from their rental properties. The other reason is that they understand investments are meant to be long-term and slow plays that don't just make you a ton of money overnight. They've invested before. They've seen this. They own some doors already. I think a lot of people that haven't already bought rental properties, they expect them to make a lot more a lot sooner than they do. And they understand that it takes time, patience, and rent growth for your asset to really start putting money in your pocket. And you got to stabilize it. There's incidentals. There's fixing all the little surprises that happen in year one and year two before your property starts to become really predictable per se. So they understand that. And the third thing is they're a little different psychologically. These rich folks, especially the self-made ones, which most of them are, they got there for a reason. They got there because they learned to do what they love and they've learned to appreciate the process that gets you the results, not just chase after the result only. Right? They care about results, but they really care about what they do. They understand that what they do is integral to their life. Their efforts are something that they don't want to give up. And that's what got them there in the first place. It's kind of ironic. You ever heard about like Michael Jordan when he stopped playing basketball? He had to take up fishing because he just couldn't fucking chill. He couldn't unwind from that competitive mindset. Why couldn't he unwind? Because the things that made him Michael Jordan were exactly the things that made it impossible for him to sit down and relax. It's the case with a lot of successful people. So embrace that and then figure out how to unteach yourself the grindhouse mentality when you can actually afford to chill, right? <laughs> but the rich people, they don't want to retire. I've never encountered, it's always the clients that say, I want, to, I want to buy rentals to quit my job. They're always the clients that have 100K to spend. And this is no disrespect to these guys. You're not, I'm not calling them poor, right? 100K is a lot of money. But the clients that have 100K to spend, just getting into their first rental or two. These guys are the ones that go, I want to quit my job. If anyone does say it, not all of them do. The clients that have 500 or a million to spend, I've never heard them utter these words. So there's your five. I want you guys to use every single one of these. They're all critical. Not one without the other. All five of them are necessary for you to be successful as an investor, highly successful over the long term. I don't mean retire when you're 59 and just have enough money to cover the rest of your life. I mean to build something that you can you know, really talk to your kids about, right? Be proud of. 
exceptional. Uh, just something that you wouldn't just meet someone else on the streets who's done. The five R, I'll recap them. I hope you wrote them down already. The millionaire investors, they keep cash. The million inv millionaire investors make quick decisions and invest in this skill. That's number two. The skill to be able to make quick decisions. The millionaire investors don't try to eke out slightly higher returns in exchange for effort or wasted time or not allocating their funds. The millionaire investors, number four, they keep their business and their investments separate. And they also keep their management of their time as a resource and management of money as a resource very separate. And number five, the millionaire investors don't talk about retiring early. It's never their investment goal. They're always just trying to put their money to highest and best use so they can get right back to it. That's it. So talk to me, y'all. Um, I'll take some questions. We got about eight minutes and then we're going to do that giveaway. Get on out of here. This was a, a fun live session for me. Sounds like you guys liked it too because there was a bunch of hearts getting jammed over here. Keep hitting that. But just spam that fucking button if you're on here though, right? I mean, I'm not getting paid to be here. So just please make the algorithm love me. Uh, do seven figure players want larger properties or cool with a bunch of smaller ones? Well, I noticed the really big ones, like the eight figure players, the ones who have $10 million to move, they have a hard time moving it fast enough with the smaller properties, right? The seven figure ones don't. So the folks with a lot of money, eight figures to invest, you know, five million a year of income, they're usually in need of a system that can really allocate money rapidly. And since there are, if they're not in the real estate game, like I'm in the real estate game, I can move millions of dollars of capital into smaller properties pretty efficiently because I've got a system that like brings this product to me on a regular basis that meets my criteria. They don't. So a lot of them will just go like passive syndication or you'll even see like a lot of people will just pour these things into funds because they don't have the time and energy unless they're in the real estate business. Now, if they're in the real estate business, a lot of them do go with like one to $5 million properties. I'm not talking about the syndicators. These guys bring on a bunch of investor money anyway. So right? I'm talking about the folks with their own money. They go with a couple million dollar properties so they can buy fewer a year. My niche is buying these smaller ones, so I'm not competing with them. And hell, I'm getting some freaking deals. So it's working out nice for me. Uh, do I wholesale? Yes, I do in some sort of way. It's like a highly evolved wholesaling business. Uh, what else do you got? So here's the thing. You got to be careful of the premium, you know, preferring bigger stuff for a premium in certain markets. That premium is extremely high in other markets. That premium is not as high. So in today's market, I think that premium is particularly high. That's why I've avoided that asset class. I'm um, also, I don't want to deal with like my business being securitized, uh, meaning I have to sell shares of bigger real estate portfolios to you guys and then be subject to the SEC. And then I can't say the crazy shit I say on these lives. I might not even be able to drop F bombs, right? Because the government's watching me uh, and they say I might be, um, what influencing you to misrepresent the performance of an asset because I say fuck a lot on Friday morning. You know, I don't even have whiskey in my hands anymore. Uh, do I like mixed use property? Uh, I don't target it, but I have a couple mixed use properties that I own and they're primarily residential with a commercial space, usually with a long-term tenant. And I usually buy them since I don't know that game. I usually buy them as if I, I, that commercial space wasn't there and I place zero value to it. And then it's still gotta be a great deal. So they've been home runs, the ones that I've gotten. Uh, one thing you guys should really learn, uh, not just from, from me investing in real estate and these lives, but also like the millionaire investors, they don't play outside of their niche. Like they don't get too distracted, right? Don't let that whole like serial entrepreneur thing, um, get into your head. I'd say the majority of successful entrepreneurs are highly focused and they'll turn down other opportunities that could be profitable because they're opportunities that they don't have like a level of mastery in executing, which is something that becomes very important. I can actually, I would prefer to buy an investment that isn't the best investment in the marketplace that I know and understand well and have advantages in. So develop those advantages in one place so that you can go, I don't care if this is the best or I don't know if Indiana is the best place in the country objectively to invest looking at broader market statistics, but I know that I'm crushing it. I'm getting great deals. I'm picking great sub markets. I have good operators. I have good banking relationships. I'm able to pass these benefits on to my clients. And I think my smarter clients realize that as well. They don't think it's necessarily the best stock to pick in the whole country, right? But they understand that it's a stock that they can operate because this is a business, not a passive investment, right? 
Do I think there's an affordability issue with current rates? Uh, well, absolutely, there's an affordability issue with current rates, and I think the market will soften up to substantiate it. But it doesn't look like liquidity is out yet, right? Like people's pockets aren't empty enough yet. I also don't know how permanent these rates are, because like the nature of this like it, you know inflationary event wasn't like a you know organic gradual thing, right? It was a buildup of like monetary policy plus like economic and like production events over time that created very rapid changes in like the, the you know the supply demand curve, right? And then like cost for, you know, for producers is really high. The labor market's really weird. I think there could be like rapid changes in either direction at any given point in time. So I don't know how these rates are going to remain like this. I don't know if they're going to remain high enough for, for long enough to crash the housing market, considering how good of shape the banks are in right now. So creditors are in really, really good shape right now compared to like 2008, where they were in really bad financial shape. They were under-regulated and they had a lot of really low quality assets on their books. The assets on their books, the, the paper, commercial paper, and like the mortgage-backed security market is in much better shape now than it was in 2008. So does that market suddenly get way cheaper? I don't know. Does it get more affordable by means of like price reductions in the crazy stuff, in the particularly crazy cities, and then rates kind of normalizing? Maybe prices stay pretty flat while wages increase over time slowly? Maybe the housing market changes. Maybe a product that becomes more frequently purchased is one that's a more efficient product and people just don't buy as much, as much space, as much house. Maybe there's a whole lot of two-story, narrow, 2,000 square feet, three bedroom or four bedroom, three baths on point, you know, one acre lots, 0 0.08 acre lots. We're seeing a whole lot of that pop up. Um, it might be just a change in the housing product to accommodate what the buyer needs. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, my friend got a seven-year arm and bought three months ago. How do you think they should refi? I mean, I use arms on like my commercial deals, but they all have like some sort of arm, right? Uh, like most commercial loans have a balloon payment. So if it was on a residential property, I don't know. I don't know their, their rate. I don't know what's available on the marketplace. I don't know what house they bought. I don't know their financial position, but I know when it comes to commercial stuff, I just stick with my arms. I'm good with it. I'm fine with the market rates. I buy a property that... I'm not reliant on mortgage rates to be able to make a confident purchase decision on. I, I leave a lot of room to sensitize for potentially higher rates in the future and go, I would still buy this at this higher rate, or I would still refi this in five or seven years at this higher rate. Uh, guys, this is all going to get posted to after. So you can watch this again on the weekend. Nice short live with your coffee. I'll take one more solid question. Uh, someone said, can you please explain number three again? Okay, so this is a good question. Number three was the millionaire investors don't try to eke out slightly higher returns. So this is kind of similar to like when you buy something and then you work really hard to try to find a better deal and you end up spending more than your time, more time than, more time value than the money you saved. Maybe that's the best way I could put it, right? Uh, maybe you're looking for a rental property to purchase and you want that rental property to be at a, 5% discount from market value at the bare minimum to purchase it, right? Maybe it's a $150,000 duplex and you're saving 7,500. Well, maybe you spend six months looking for that deal instead of one month. You pass on a deal at one month that could have got you market value and you spend six months, five more looking for that deal. What's five months of your time and acquisitions effort worth or canceled inspections or, or botched relationships with realtors? or returns that you didn't actually get on the property, or other things you would have been doing after you bought that property to add more value to either your business or to focus on your primary income source, or to sit fucking back and have a beer and just chill, right? So these investors, these rich investors are smart. They've learned that they don't wanna trade work for slightly higher returns on their investment. They have higher value things to do. So they just get the deal done. They just buy the index fund instead of trying to beat the market and study a bunch of articles on a bunch of different stocks to try to pick the best one to maybe outperform, right? They just go for what's there so that they can allocate and move on. It's a smart thing to do. It took a lot of maturity for me to realize that I needed to do that too. And it's still something I, I constantly have to remind myself of when I find myself engaging in what I would consider frugal behavior. Right, which a lot of investors have frugal behavior. We're cheap. We want to save the most money. We don't want to overpay. We want to make the best purchase possible. But at some point, frugality gets you to a point where you can be successful and wealthy. And then all of a sudden, like the scale inverts, right? The curve completely inverts where now, now that you're at that point, uh, your time is worth more than your money. 
and you've got to recognize that and respect that and you've got to change the way that you make investment decisions and business decisions as a result. So there's my extra explanation of number three. Thank you guys very much for joining me. It was a great freaking turnout today. There was like 300 plus people throughout most of this live. That giveaway is coming soon, so watch out for the code and I will see y'all next Friday.